Welcome once again to the Undergraduate Research Symposium and to our second of two keynotes, this one on global knowledge and competency in your career. I am delighted to introduce um, Jessica Kuntz from the Department of State. Jessica Kuntz is a Foreign Service Officer there. Before working at the State Department, she did consulting and research for several organizations. She earned her master's degree in public policy and political economy from the University of Pittsburgh. While at Pitt, she completed an internship with the UN Development Program, and she was also a Boren Research Fellow for the National Security Education Program uh, working in Bosnia. Next, we have Dr. Erna Barno. He's a user experience researcher at Facebook, where he works to increase transparency and accountability around content regulation. Before his work there, he was Director of Social and Behavior Science at Democracy International, an organization that promotes citizenship and development in four areas, politics, governance, peace and resilience, and learning. He earned his doctorate in comparative politics and mass political behavior at the University of Pittsburgh. So very pleased to have our two University of Pittsburgh uh, alumni representing and sharing their knowledge with you. Um, I'll start with a question for both of you. Um, and Jessica, you can go first unless you prefer otherwise. Um, can you talk about your current uh, positions and a little bit about what they entail and um, just how your paths led you to this point? Maybe we can work backwards from there. Sure. Um, thank you, Susan. Thank you for the invitation to be here. It's great to speak to and see all of your, in theory, see your faces. Um, I'm a Foreign Service Officer. Uh, the Department of State, so essentially there's two different trajectories. Um, we have a civil service, um, which is generally our folks who work in Washington for their full career. Uh, and then the other half of the department are foreign service officers. And we spend most, but not all of our career working in embassies and consulates abroad. Um, we do have options to go back and serve in DC for limited periods of time. Um, but as contained in the name, uh, most of our job it, it occurs outside of the United States. Um, I've worked as a foreign service officer for the past four years. Um, I joined at the beginning of 2017 um, and just celebrated four years in March. Um, I've been in Tel Aviv, Israel for the past few years. Um, I'm currently in the United States um, and my onward assignment will be to Brasilia. Um, don't quite have an exact date for that because I've got some other personal stuff going on. Uh, but our careers are essentially broken up into tours that last from two to four years each. Um, and we kind of move around the world into different jobs. So in terms of my current job, I'll talk maybe a little bit more about what my job will be in Brasilia. Um, Cause right now I'm just trying to maintain my Portuguese and wait to get to Brasilia. Um, but my assignment in Brasilia um, is in the political section. Um, all embassies have sort of five different sections. Um, political, economic, uh, public affairs, uh, management, and consular. Um, so I will be in political doing human rights reporting out of Brazil. So the vast majority of that job is spent developing contacts out in country um, who provide you with you, who provide you with information. Um, you then package that information up and share it with Washington. Um, so I think it's important to note because it's something I didn't necessarily realize when I was getting into the State Department um, the Foreign Service really does not make foreign policy. Um, we inform, we share information and facts that come from our sources on the ground. Um, with Washington, the policy is made in Washington and we implement the policy. Um, so just, just to clarify on that. And then in terms of my trajectory into the Foreign Service, um, I do have both my undergrad and my master's degree were internationally focused. Um, I went to Georgetown for undergrad where I studied security studies, kind of thinking that I was gonna go more into like the intelligence analyst space. Um, did a handful of internships when I was at Georgetown, more in the Intel space um, and just realized that I really didn't like it. Um, so did an about face and um, applied for a Fulbright when I was a senior at Georgetown um, to Croatia which is kind of what got me interested in the State Department in the first place. I, it's Croatia's small country, small Fulbright program. Um, and I was lucky enough to have quite a bit of interaction with some of the embassy staff there and get to see like what the State Department actually did abroad and what the job of the Foreign Service officer was. Um, and I was just really inspired by some of the officers I met. 
um, just really smart, passionate people. Um, so that is what then attracted me to the State Department. Um, I ultimately did not join the State, Mar State Department for another like six years, seven years, something like that. Um, in the meantime, I got a graduate degree at Pitt, um, took a year off from said graduate degree to do a Boren in Bosnia, so went back to the Balkans. Um, and then coming out of, uh, I went to Gispia, the public policy school at Pitt. Um, I actually worked for Deloitte for a couple of years. Um, and at that point, it was kind of like, I already knew I was interested in the Foreign Service. I applied. The Foreign Service hiring process is like much of the government, very slow and bureaucratic. Um, and I did not want to sit around and wait for several years for them to um, fully process my application. Um, so I worked as a government consultant for Deloitte um, for two years after grad school, um, which was also fascinating. I encourage any of you to think about consulting just because it really gives you a lot of responsibility and broad exposure. Um, my clients were DOJ, um, Housing and Urban Development and Department of Energy. Um, so I really loved getting to see that side of like as much as I enjoy the international aspect of my work now. Um, it was quite cool to get to see um, all the really important domestic policy areas that uh, US government affects the lives of um, its citizens. Um, so with that, I will maybe turn it over to Aaron and look forward to hear, hearing what he has to say as well. Wow, that's a tough act to follow, quite a trajectory and really uh, well, well structured. I was going to talk to you a little bit about how I have fallen backwards into most of my uh, current uh, positions. Um, I work for Facebook. I'm a user experience researcher, which uh, essentially touches all aspects of any user engagement with uh, the technology. Uh, but more specifically than that, I work in an area at Facebook uh, called integrity. In other social media organizations, it's sometimes called health. It hasn't got anything to do with uh, actual health, but it's about reducing harms on the platforms, uh, harms ranging from things like spam and uh, inauthentic accounts to the stuff that we hear about all the time in the news, misinformation, hate speech, uh, bullying, harassment, um, nudity, exploitation of minors, human trafficking, the, the worst of the worst sort of things. Um, and within that sector, what I work on in particular is building transparency and accountability initiatives into Facebook's practices around moderating content so that people get a sense of what's going on. We have two audiences. We have the users um, who use products like or platforms like Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp and the new Oculus uh, headsets. And we have stakeholders, which basically encompasses people like uh, Jessica, um, government uh, regulators in Washington, um, academics, media, uh, journalists of all stripes, um, and civil society organizations around the world. And it's important to keep in mind that we're talking about a global audience here. There's about 3 billion users of Facebook uh, around the world. And these stakeholders uh, exist in every country and have specific interests and specific concerns around what is going on when something is pulled down or something is not pulled down from Facebook, whether we're talking about a specific post, a photo, a group page, an account. Um, it's actually quite a complicated space. Um, and the exciting project that I work on uh, most frequently and most intensively is the Oversight Board. Um, you may have heard of it recently in the news uh, because the Oversight Board upheld a Facebook content moderation decision, which was to uh, remove Donald Trump's page from the platform for an indefinite period of time. And the Oversight Board is an independent organization uh, comprised of civil society experts, um, legal experts, uh, former heads of state, for instance, the former prime minister of, of uh, Denmark, uh, and many others who are essentially organized like an appeals court into small panels to rule on cases that come to them either one of two ways, either a Facebook user files the report uh, or Facebook uh, 
submits a request to the board to review a high profile decision such as the Trump case. Um, my job there to get back to international work and what on earth this has to do with anything that Eustace does um, is that I, on the Facebook side, it's all independent, the oversight board. But what I do is I make sure that the, the access to this kind of procedural justice is equitable uh, across countries and across users. You can think about situations like um, you may have in countries with less than stellar uh, free speech protections or other kinds of organizing protections where the government may do one or two things that clamp down on speech. Someone posts something uh, to criticize it, but it gets caught up in a regulation or a rule at Facebook and pulled down. And by doing that, Facebook has inadvertently uh, sort of muffled a protest somewhere. Well, this user needs to have the same access. This user, whether they be educated or uh, highly uneducated, whether they be in the West, uh, in the global North, or in a developing country, uh, whether they work on an the latest Apple phone or on an and a low end Android device that is common in a lot of countries, they need to have the same accessibility to this uh, route of, of, um, of appeal. So my work is in accessibility uh, in various ways in getting people access to this procedural justice. It's a kind of a follow on from work I was doing before I joined Facebook about a year ago. I worked in um, international development with an organization called USAID, the US Agency for International Development, for three years uh, in their Center of Excellence on Democracy, Human Rights, and Governance, where I specialized in um, essentially randomized controlled trial evaluations of development programs. Um, and then I moved on to a government contractor called Democracy International, which implements programs that the government, particularly USAID, um, requests via different kinds of solicitation devices. Uh, and I did that for about three and a half years. And my work took me to places like Tunisia, Colombia, Bangladesh, Nepal, Peru, Cambodia, Georgia, Barbados, Guyana, um, places I, I couldn't have imagined going um, as an undergraduate at Pitt, where I also studied as history and Italian major, um, and nor even as a uh, grad student, where I studied mostly West European politics and Central Europe a bit. Um, and so I would say that, you know, it's all set me up for this kind of um, flexibility in, in, in applying, uh, I think, what, what you've called this title, this session, competency and knowledge. I think knowledge is, it comes with uses and competency is, is the application of that over time in many different situations. And, um, and, and my sort of falling backwards into Facebook, I say fell backwards because I just decided on a whim that I wanted to change career trajectories and to keep learning and pushing myself into something that was a bit unusual and unknown to me. And I think that kind of, if you want to call that daring, it's something that you learn basically through the kind of experiences you get at USIS. So I think that's where I'll stop for the intros. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Okay, excellent. Um, I put a note, uh, if you have questions, please feel free to raise your hand or um, turn on your mic and speak directly. And again, um, if you'd prefer to put questions in the chat, I'll monitor them. Usually once one person asks a question, a whole bunch of others follow. So somebody please dare to be first. <laughs> Eric? Oh, yeah, can, can you guys hear me? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, I actually have two questions, the first of which is directed towards Jessica, and then the second one I think is applicable to uh, both speakers. Um, so my, my first question is, uh, Jessica, you said you uh, were on uh, a, a born to uh, Croatia and a Fulbright to Bosnia. I, I might have gotten them mixed up. You but swapped it, them, but... They're the Balkans. They're right uh, next to each other. It's five hours apart. Anyway, uh, so I was kind of surprised to hear that because you said now you're in Tel Aviv and then you're going to be going to Brazil. Um, yeah. And so uh, that was kind of 
Well, they don't really have much to What do you mean? It's a natural with. regional pairing. Are you, are you familiar <laughs> with the powerful alliance of Croatia, Brazil, and <laughs> yeah. So I, I was just curious to hear more about um, that trajectory and whether that was just an instance of state saying, okay, we need somebody here and you're going to fill that position um, or if that was kind of guided by you. Um, and I'll, I'll let you answer that before I ask the second question. Yeah, so I came into the State Department interested in Eastern Europe and the Balkans. Um, my certificate from USIS is in EU studies, but like I've had the year in Croatia, I had the year in Bosnia, it's just like what I knew. Um, but the State Department is also notorious for taking somebody who knows Chinese and sending them to Mexico and taking the person who speaks Spanish and sending them to the Philippines. Um, and my experience has been very consistent with that. Uh, when they hire us uh, and when we kind of develop through our careers, we're all called generalists, meaning that we're not, we aren't really hired for a specific expertise. Um, whereas like USAID hires their foreign service officers with a specific knowledge in mind. So they have foreign service officers who specialize in agriculture, who specialize in rule of law, who specialize in um, uh, like clean water infrastructure, things like this, people who really have this deep knowledge, they likely bring previous experience to the job in that field. Some foreign service officers on the State Department do have a particular region or a particular like area that they that they specialize in, but more often than not, your first, I would say like two to four tours in the State Department, um, they don't really enable you to specialize in that. Um, I've met a few people who kind of came in and they were like, I became a foreign service officer because I really want to work in Turkey. And that is a terrible, terrible approach because you very well may go your entire career and never get to go to Turkey. It works a lot better if you say like, I'm interested in South America. Like you'll get to South America at some point. It might not be your first tour or your second tour, but that's a broad enough region that like you can make it happen. Um, but yeah, they, they don't necessarily, like it may arise in the future that, if a tour opens up and it lines up with my timing um, and like what level I am, like just like um, in the private sector, you know, we have different rankings, like where there's more senior, more mid-level, more junior employees. And you know, I can't bid for an ambassador job as like a third level, a uh, third tour uh, officer. Um, but I would love to go back to the Balkans. They wouldn't prevent me from doing so. Um, but there's not necessarily an emphasis on the State Department in making sure that they match up my assignments with my previous experience. Um, they teach us most of what we need to know. So I've done both Hebrew and Portuguese at the Foreign Service Institute, which they teach many things, but like languages are kind of their bread and butter. Um, and then a lot of what we do is really just like getting up to speed quickly. Um, so I'm not expected to be an expert in Brazil. They know I don't, you know, I've never lived there. Um, I don't have, I don't even like have a degree in human rights necessarily. Um, this was just the assignment I was given. Um, and the expectation is that I'm gonna ask smart questions and develop contacts and read a lot um, in order to get up to speed relatively quickly. Um, but yes, you put your finger very much on a characteristic aspect of the lifestyle. People are like, oh, you're, huh, no, I don't. For a while, for a while, I said frozen conflicts was going to be my thing. It was going to be like Bosnia and Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv right now is a little less frozen. Um, Brazil's kind of ruining my brand. So I'm going to have to like rework that. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that insight because as it turns out, I, I, I do study Turkish, right? <laughs> so, uh, and, and so, I, and uh, I'm I'm actually a born scholar uh, to Azerbaijan. I went to Azerbaijan last year, so okay. there's 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 some similarities. Um, all right. Uh, so, my second question is for both of you, and it's just um, related to the education level of your peers. Like, for instance, uh, every FSO I've ever talked to has had a, a graduate degree. Um, but, uh, officially, right. I think you only need a high school diploma. Um, and so I was just curious to hear what your experience with your, uh, the education level of your peers, if, if you happen to know it. Um, and I think this also, uh, applies to Aaron because, uh, you've also gotten a graduate degree. Um, so as somebody who's considering graduate school myself, it's, it's yeah, helpful. So this is just like speaking from my personal experience and I meant to give this disclaimer up front. This, I'm not speaking like 
nothing I say is the official stance of the U.S. Department of State or the U.S. government, um, just kind of me speaking from a, a personal perspective. Um, so weirdly, in my experience, academic credentials don't really come into play that much once you're hired by the State Department. Um, like, I would have a hard time telling you where any of my colleagues went to school um, that I worked with in Tel Aviv. And these are people I knew pretty well. Uh, the handful that I know is simply because like we became very close friends as, like outside. So it's not like the negative connotation of the Foreign Service is pale male and Yale, um, meaning white male and like Ivy League. Um, and there's probably still like, yes, it's we have a hard time promoting women, for example. We bring in um, pretty much 50 50, um, but we have a hard time retaining women. Um, we have a real challenge with minorities. Um, and like they've worked very hard in the past 15 years to try and uh, fix that, but it's still a big issue. Um, but on the education side, like there, I have not experienced that elitism necessarily. I don't think most people have ever even asked me where I go to school. And it's kind of hard to be elitist when you don't know where the school um, is that people attended. I would say I had one colleague who I know was a PhD dropout. Um, he, I think, was doing a PhD program in literature and decided it wasn't for him anymore and became a foreign service officer instead. Um, a handful of colleagues who used to be lawyers in their previous life, like practice law for five, 10, 15 years, um, decided they didn't want to do that anymore and kind of came to the foreign service in another route. I don't think they use their law degrees as foreign service officers, but they do technically have them. Um, and then the rest of them, I would say it was about half, half people who had a master's and people who didn't. Um, you are correct that you don't technically need a bachelor's degree to apply to the foreign service. I've not actually met anyone without a college degree. They might be out there. Um, but it could also just be like an exposure and awareness thing, like what high school senior has heard of the foreign service and would apply. Um, but yeah, it's certainly not a majority that have um, a master's, but probably probably like half ish. Um, and PhD, definitely not necessary. There's like a handful, um, but yeah, it, I think that's kind of an uncommon trajectory. That's a lot of time to spend in academia and then decide you want to go do like a consular job and stamp visas for like two to four years of your life. I think this is a really interesting question, Eric. You know, I think there's a broader issue here of what is the value of expertise and how do you establish that expertise? Um, in general, the education level of my peers at Facebook, this is a first for me, uh, everyone in the research organization at Facebook, almost everyone has a doctorate. Um, almost everyone is a professionally trained researcher, whether that be for, you know, through a survey methodology focus, a large and data science orientation, or, uh, you know, some kind of qualitative ethnographic focus. Everybody is a researcher. Um, prior to joining Facebook, and in fact, it is oftentimes a requirement for the job. Um, this is not true of user experience research elsewhere. Um, in mm -hmm. fact, it's very, I would say much, I'd say it's rather uncommon for user experience research in general. Uh, but there are master's degrees that prepare people for this kind of work because it is a bit um, unusual and it, it's, it's, it requires a great deal of empathy, which you learn through your studies in particular international exposure um, as an undergrad, but it's, it's something that you know, the methods are, are a bit peculiar and, and, and they're rather focused only in that sector. sector. When I was at the uh, USAID, I found I was rather surprised to find that a lot of my colleagues in the civil service, um, so not foreign service officers, but uh, civil service professionals, uh, did have uh, higher degrees, higher level degrees, either doctorates uh, or, well, in fact, most of them had master's degrees. And um, in my second job off out of government, but in the sector, almost nobody had a doctorate. I was, I think, the only person with a doctorate. Um, and almost everybody had a master's degree. So I have a really strong opinions about the following. I think that um, in Washington, my experience being, um, you do not need a PhD for entry. You don't need a master's degree for entry. It's easier 
with a doctorate. It's not necessarily easier with a master's degree because a lot of people have master's degrees now. Um, not a lot of people in Washington, generally speaking, as a rule, I think, have doctorates. Um, and if they do, they tend to have doctorates from schools in the area, um, more often than not, that prepare them specifically for work um, in government organizations, more often than not, unless they're on the science side, like the USDA or other kinds of uh, really specialized uh, uh, <clears throat> agencies. The question is whether it has any value to the job. And I think that is something you can talk long and hard about because at some point, the degree that you bring in and the expertise, like if you study, if you dedicate your life to a subject matter, which is essentially what you do when you study for your doctorate, you close off the rest of the world. You don't do any good stuff like you're doing at USIS. You become a single act, a one act pony. I mean, you really dig in so far that you know more about your topic than your advisors at the end of your road. Um, that is helpful at first because it sets you apart and it gives you a new lens. But after a while, that fades into the background and you then are relying entirely on your experience. Um, and I think you can build the same kind of solid reputation without such a degree and without dedicating so much time uh, if you are able to acquire strong experience. Um, I think something else that I'd like to echo, one other thing that Jessica said, which was about how the State Department tends to uh, push people around without regard for what they did previously. Um, until I got to Facebook, I was completely unfamiliar with that model. I was a democracy, human rights, and governance specialist uh, from my PhD all the way through uh, my work in, in Washington. And my reputation got to a point where my reputation preceded me because I was um, only in the same sector and constantly building on their reputation. At Facebook, once I got there, nobody cared. And the idea was, okay, welcome. Uh, you got in, uh, now go work with those people to solve problems that you've never seen before. And probably they haven't seen either. And that becomes a wild, like wild new world of and way of doing things, which is not unlike um, what Jessica described, where you're tossed into an entirely new environment and expected to ramp up quickly, learn fast, uh, make sense of things, and then you know draw on what exists in your mind already as like a mental model for what what you should do. But yeah, um, if you get a master's degree, I I would recommend you get some work experience first and then go back to school. But everyone's situation is different. Yeah, I would second that. I, I left it out because it's not really relevant to what I ended up doing, but I spent a year working at a PR firm in New York um, before, like between Fulbright and going to Gispia, um, mainly just because going into government in particular, I felt like it was really valuable to come in with some pri pri private sector experience and ideas as to best practices. Um, Cause there's such a mentality in the government of like, this is how things have always been done. This is how we're gonna keep doing them. I didn't want to fall into that. Um, and I figured, like, I was young. I was 28 or 29 when I joined the Foreign Service. Um, but I thought even the you know, three years private sector experience I had, plus the Fulbright, plus the Boring, gave me some exposure to, like, hmm, here's things that I've seen that work well, and here's some things that don't, and how can those processes be improved? Um, just because I was very cautious of, you know, like, I went into government because I wanted to um, make a difference, um, improve the functioning of government, um, improve the reputation of the United States abroad. Um, and I did not want to just like push those buttons. Like these are the processes that have worked for the State Department for the past 237 years. Um, so I very intentionally um, spent at least a bit of time outside of government before I went into it. Um, that's not the only way to do it necessarily, but I do think it's important to like maintain some independent thinking when you're working for the government so you don't just become a cog. Um, and I think it helps if you, you've seen how other organizations work. Thanks, thanks for starting the conversation, Eric. Okay, any other questions? Oh, we have one, let me get to the comments. Oh, I think it's not a question. It's just a statement. <laughs> it's ahead. a long question. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, so it oh. says, Eric, and everyone else who is interested in the Foreign Service, I'll be earning my MA at Kispia in this fellow. Um, 
the, as a 2021 Wrangell Fellow, the fellowship aims to increase diversity in the Foreign Service, um, and it requires you to earn a graduate degree, but helps you pay for it with scholarship and stipend. After graduating, again, this is the Wrangell Fellowship, um, you serve as an FO in the Consular Officer Cone for five years. And there is some information in the chat and the email. So that was my quick paraphrase. So that's in the chat if you want to copy and paste that. Okay. Any other, and thank you. Any others? I always have some, but I want to be careful not to hijack from um, the students. So I have a follow up question, but I'll, I'll wait to see if anybody else has any questions first. Um, okay. I'm going to ask a general one that might trigger some questions and thoughts if I can. One thing I noticed in both your bios, and I think I said this to you in an email, is that you know, you've worked, yes, your careers might slant more towards one sector than the others, but you've both worked in government sectors, um, corporate, private sector, and the nonprofit sector. So um, can you talk about any of the nuances or the commonalities um, among those and maybe what surprised you in each se sector in a good way? Any preferences that you have? If you could just kind of riff on <laughs> your experience of working in those different types of sectors, that would be great. I don't know who would prefer to go first. Uh, I can start. Okay. Um, so I would say, sorry, I'm very echoey. I'm not sure why that is. Um, oh, we're hearing you fine. Down, maybe help. My experience is less this is how the public sector is and this is how the private sector is. I don't think there's that clear dichotomy necessarily. There's a lot of diversity within public. There's a lot of diversity within private. Um, but beyond that, I would say my experience is that what we would refer to as like corporate culture, or I don't know what we would call it, department culture, I guess, is what we say in the State Department, is very, very real. Um, and it is so important to your success in that organization to successfully characterize and identify that corporate slash department culture and figure out how to tweak your behavior to work effectively within it. Um, I, so Deloitte, um, which is where I was for two years as a consultant, private sector, um, you know, kind of like a billing by the hour model is a very, very flat organization. Um, there's an expectation that everybody in the organization, if you have an idea, you're expected to speak up and share it. Um, they have an open door policy that if you have questions, you wanna talk about career stuff, whatever it may be, um, every partner, it's like a law firm kind of structure wise, um, has open office hours and has open doors and it truly works like that. Um, so I was I, like, I liked that aspect of Deloitte. It was very empowering. Um, it put a lot of responsibility and had high expectations um, of their junior staff. Uh, and there was never a sense of like, oh, you're speaking out of turn. Um, I came to the State Department then, kind of being somewhat raised in this culture. Uh, and I'd always heard the State Department is very hierarchical. Then I heard that and I was like, okay, you know, I understand hierarchy, like ambassador on top. I'm not an idiot, I got it. Um, but the State Department is the reverse corporate culture of Deloitte. Um, it's very much like, do not speak up unless you are spoken to. Like, if it is not your turn to speak in the meeting, you will not speak. It's seen as like very insubordinate if you do, if you um, like step outside of the typical way in which things are done. Um, and I spent probably the first year in the State Department really fighting that. Um, and I was pretty much determined, like, I'm going to do things the way that I want to do them. Like, I'm a millennial. I don't, like, I'm not going to play by these stupid State Department rules. I still don't think it's the most efficient way to organize an organization. Uh, but what I learned is that it just hurt me. Like, it made me much more ineffective to just try and fight the department culture, um, which I think lots of people have that realization and leave the State Department. They say, like, oh, I don't want to deal with this. Um, which is a perfectly valid response to it. You have to know like how much of the else are you willing to put up with effectively. Um, but near the end of that first year, I had a, she wasn't really my supervisor. She was like my language supervisor. And we had just been butting heads the entire time because I kept on like circumventing like the department hierarchy to try and get things done. Um, and we had like a three hour long, like lay it all on the table. And she ended up being like this wonderful mentor, which is like, that's good. Somebody who can say like, you're driving me nuts, but then like, let's move on to that. And like, she said to me at that point, she's like, I see what you want to do. 
it's not going to work. She's like, we need more people like you in the State Department, but you are not going to succeed if you keep on trying to take this approach. Um, so hearing that was really important for me um, to realize that, like, this is a huge organization. And that's true of any government bureaucracy, but a lot of private sector as well. Um, and in order to, you are one person, um, in order to be effective within it, you need to play by the rules. Um, you Like sometimes there are shortcuts you can figure out, you can figure out how to work the system, but you need to figure out how that system works. Um, and I'm sure like to go back to the public private, I'm sure there's like more general characterizations that if I'd like served in other government organizations I could identify. Um, I don't necessarily have a broad enough picture. I mean, I did college internships at like DHS and DIA, um, but it was, you know, like a summer, like two and a half months that I didn't necessarily have enough time there to really like figure out how the place worked. Um, but that is generally the guidance I would give, whether you go for public, private, or whether or not you kind of spend a career jumping between them, um, make it a priority early on when you get to the organization um, to kind of like step back, watch, ask questions, figure out like, hey, if I send this email, um, who do I need to CC? Um, like, who do I need to get permission from to do certain things? It's stupid and frustrating sometimes because it feels like you're wasting time on just like procedure when you want to just work on policy. Um, but ultimately, in any of these jobs, like you need allies and you need people in your court. Um, and in order to do that, you need to master the corporate slash department culture. I just, I think that's all really solid. I, <clears throat> I would just add, you know, a bit of advice that my uh, PhD advisor, Steve Finkel, gave to me before I left for Washington. He said, um, you know, don't be the smartest guy in the room, even if you are the smartest person in the room. Um, and I think that kind of encapsulates this idea of sitting back and, and making sure that you understand the place before um, trying to, you know, upend the table. Um, Fortunately, I was never the smartest person in the room, so I didn't have that problem. Um, I think the other thing I would add is, you know, I've worked in nonprofit, um, corporate uh, tech and government uh, and academia. And I think that the differences, you know, cultural culture building is a huge thing at, at, at Facebook uh, and in most corporations, I think. I didn't see it as much at, um, at USAID and at, not very much at all at my nonprofit. Um, basically, what I mean by that is that there are, um, you know, ways to build team sentiment and uh, and belonging, and that's always that I find that very interesting. Of course, doing that at a company that hired that, that has more than fifty thousand employees is even more fascinating, um, as like a sociological sort of thing. Um, the speed at which these places work is vastly different. Um, Facebook moves very fast to get things out the door. Um, and USAID, for instance, moves very slow um, by government standards. You know, it's it's a bureaucracy with hierarchy. But I think if I had to pin down one thing that distinguishes the three, um, it's all of these organizations, all these sectors are mission driven. The thing that distinguishes them, I think, is the luxury to be able to adhere to the mission uh, at all costs. I think that nonprofits are free from a lot of the constraints that private sector and government uh, uh, con uh, sector have. For instance, trustees, profits, uh, budgets, uh, hierarchy, um, you know, one, one other person, you know, having a different policy view, for instance, um, the nonprofit world is, is free in theory of those sorts of things. Now there's a pl plenty of other stuff that gets in the way, uh, you know, human things, ego and, and, you know, the fact that some of these places simply can't make it and that gets very stressful. Um, but I would say there's a greater luxury of adhering to your mission at a nonprofit than there is at some of these other places. Thanks. That was very interesting for me as taking copious notes myself. I'm already on my, I think, fourth career if I count them. Ah, oh, other questions. I know Eric had one in the wings, but he graciously wanted to make sure the rest of you got a chance. One, two. Eric, would you like to go or would you like me to? No pressure. 
Yeah, no, I, I can go ahead. Um, so, uh, sorry, I, I disconnected for a second because of technical issues. Um, but so maybe this question was already answered while I was gone. Um, but uh, I was wondering about current opportunities for students. Um, and uh, I know, for instance, I know that Jessica, you said that you, uh, while you were at Georgetown, uh, you took on a couple of different internships. Uh, and so I was wondering if you could maybe elaborate more a little bit about that. And then Aaron, I know that there's um, uh, a multitude of different USAID and Facebook internships, right? Um, but one of the things that I've run up against is uh, I feel like my application is pretty competitive for various government private sector jobs, but I, I, I think uh, I have an issue of getting my application seen by a hiring manager, um, if that makes sense. Um, so anyway, I'll just, yeah, I'll hand it over. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll jump in first on this one. I think um, yeah, specifically on being seen, I, I mean, it depends on uh, where you're sending it. I mean, if you're sending it to usajobs.gov, I mean, there are some boards out there, Reddit will help you with these tips and tricks, for instance, using the language that's precisely in the job posting because these are kind of automated review at first before they go into the hiring manager's hands. Um, if you know somebody, they can flag your application for review. Um, I think a lot is, of, of access in, in Washington in particular is, is human um, connections. And so I recommend very strongly that you just reach out to people and ask for informational interviews. I've never known someone to not grant an inter informational interview. It's a very simple thing. People have do it here all the time in this city. Um, I'm in Washington, by the way. And, um, and it's just, it's the norm. So do it and it will help, you know, if, if this single person you, you talk to doesn't help out, they'll know someone who, who may and, and so on. Um, as far as getting in the front door at USAID, it's very difficult. I think you, if you want to get in the door at USAID, I recommend you join the Peace Corps or uh, do the PMF fellowship uh, after your master's degree. Otherwise, it's a pretty hard road. And But there are a lot of contractor jobs. So uh, tons of implementing organizations are out there. There's a job site called DevX. I think com, but they've got all of the the resources for those positions. Yeah, and in Facebook, there's lots of internships. And if you know someone who works at Facebook and you'd like to internship at Facebook, that would be me. I'd be happy to refer you, um, which means that your application would essentially get viewed by a recruiter uh, without having to make it past that first stop. But yeah, that's that's what I've got there. Yeah, I wish I had like words of wisdom that could overcome the horror that is USA jobs. Um, I do not. Unfortunately, government hiring, it was like well designed because it was meant to um, avoid nepotism. Um, so that created like this double blind, triple blind system. Um, but what it did is it created just this like very algorithm driven, driven system that everybody's trying to crack. I'm not actually sure I've ever gotten a job from USA jobs. I my college internships, and like, this is very dated knowledge. I graduated undergrad in 2010. Um, so like these programs may not even exist. At the time, DIA had a really good program. I was just very impressed by, um, it was all run. They paired you with your office very well. It was like timely and the clearances worked, which is not the case everywhere in the government. So I did DIA twice. Um, and I actually just went back the second summer because I like that opportunity existed. I don't even think I reapplied. I just said like, I like this. I'd like to return. They gave me a new office um, and it was paid, which is always good for government internships. Um, I did a DHS INA, which is there again, DHS has like every five years, they do a massive reorg. So INA might not exist anymore. It's intelligence and analysis. DHS has had a rough, uh, rough go of it of late. I don't know what's going on over there. Um, learned a lot about how an organization shouldn't function at DHS. Uh, I did treasury, but that was through kind of a connection. Um, my boss at Georgetown connected me with the advance office over there. So they gave me a college, inter a summer internship. Um, and then when I was in grad school, I did a couple of internships. Gispia required everybody to do one. Um, so I did a State Department internship, actually, and that was very much a case of, as Aaron said, like, if you know somebody who can flag your application, 
I went back to Croatia because I was like, I liked a year in Croatia. I want to do another summer, like near the Croatian coast. That sounds great. Um, so I had gotten to know and I'm still a very good friend. She's been a great mentor, the then um, assistant cultural attache at the U.S. Embassy. And I said to her, like, hey, any chance I can come be an intern for you? And um, it's not really supposed to work this way, but especially at the intern level, it can. Um, she said, yep, just let me know when you put in the application and we'll keep an eye out for it. So I ended up doing that. Um, and then I spent part of my born year at UN Development Program while I was in Sarajevo. And that was very much a make your own opportunity. I found that in the United States, when you're when you want to work for like government or an international organization, there are deadlines and there's a specific application. Um, and you really can't like move outside of that structure that, that they've created. Um, but when I was in Bosnia and also Croatia, um, like in, the idea of internships didn't really exist. So I just kind of started knocking on doors and like explaining what an internship was. And they were very confused. They were like, you want to work for free. What stupid American, like why? Why, why are you so dumb? Um, so then I like developed my pitch a little better. And I was like, this is what I'm interested in. This is what I can bring to your organization. And I was like 24, I don't know. I had a lot of confidence. Um, I had like one year PR experience and I was like, I am a communications expert. I will be your communications guru. Um, so in Bosnia, it was very much like, and it was unpaid, um, but I, like I was paid by Warren, so I didn't really care that much. Um, I just wanted to like get inside UNDP and like see how it worked. Uh, so that the nice thing, I guess, of going out into the field is sometimes they'll just be like, okay, like come aboard, you can do what you want to do. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, USA Jobs, which is the vast majority of civil service, possibly all civil service jobs, I know some of Intel does their own hiring, um, like CIA and whatnot has a separate portal. Um, it's a black hole. I like, I would recommend checking out those webinars that Aaron mentioned. They're probably going to give you a lot more specific, useful advice than I can. Um, but it really is a mess. Like I have a good friend who works for the FBI. She's been there for like 15 years. Um, she recently applied like through the internal system for like a director position in her regional expertise. The people doing the hiring were like, you're our top choice. We want to hire you. But like the HR people didn't put her application aside because they like missed something about her year's experience. And they were like, oh, you aren't qualified. And then it was too late to fix that. Like HR made the mistake and they couldn't like move her from one pile to another. So unfortunately, government hiring is just like terrible. Um, so like do the US or do the um, USA jobs training. Sorry, you guys are getting um, my, my, I'm at my parents' lake house and my father is mowing, mowing the lawn right now. Um, so I will finish this up. But beyond that, I think it's just a matter of persistence for a lot. Cause like, you'll have things like that where you're like, but I was extraordinarily qualified and some HR person just accidentally put you on the wrong slot because they misread your application. Um, so as frustrating it is, as it is, I think it's probably just a numbers game. Um, figuring out how to work the system, but then also just like putting in a lot of applications. And then Foreign Service is like its own separate application process, which is not all USA jobs. Um, it's Foreign Service, for, like, I think they could make a great reality show out of the Foreign Service application process myself, but it would be really great. I mean, there's great advice there, um, strategic for everyone listening, which is that, you know, you have to hustle. And it's a luxury uh, for some of us, um, either on fellowship who have the money to be able to do that uh, or who are not on fellowship but have money set aside to do that. So I think, you know, one thing that's maybe not talked about in planning for your career is if you're, if you're able to set aside a little bit of money to give yourself a cushion so that you can hustle and try to knock on doors and get where you need to go in order to, to find a way in. Um, the story of getting into UNDP is familiar to me from a lot of my colleagues at USAID, uh, who, you know, for instance, I, one colleague was in Liberia after the war, uh, just working, you know, trying to get a job as a communications advisor and doing exactly that, just cold calling every director or chief of party of every program that was going on, trying to find a role. The only reason she was able to do that was she was able to fund herself. And um, so, you know, the financial side here is is something to keep in mind of, of putting, trying to prepare yourself for that. 
That's really helpful. And a lot of what you said, you know, you won't, I used to teach career exploration and theory, and you won't find these pieces of wisdom in the books on <laughs> career searching, you know, the networking piece, the, you know, having a cushion to allow you to <laughs> research and take risks. The other thing I mentioned is especially when you're like coming out of undergrad, keep in mind that whatever your first job or even second job ends up being is really not that relevant. Um, like there's so many people who think like, I want to work for Facebook, uh, Google, the state department, the UN, whatever, like big bright name. First off, your entry-level job at that organization is probably going to be really boring. Um, you're probably better to go for like a smaller organization that's going to empower you as a junior level officer. But the thing is like careers move so much uh, that like you do need a first job. Definitely like once you have that first job and you start making connections, it makes it really easy to move around. But people put, and like I did as well. Um, so I remember how it was, but you put like so much importance on like, well, what, what's going to be on my resume for that first job? Like that's going to make or break everything. And it really won't. Um, like as long as you are learning from whatever position you are in at the time and you are using that position to broaden your network, both within, um, but also outside, um, like connections will come up that you didn't expect. So, you know, to the point of USA, when I was uh, in Bosnia for my Boren, knocking on US UNDP's door and, and often everyone's door, like every single international organization is in Sarajevo. Like it's this weird microcosm of like international governance. And USAID had a project there um, that was being run by Deloitte. Um, I didn't, had not worked for Deloitte at the, that time and they were doing like local economic development. And I somehow connected with them. I don't remember how at this point. Uh, and the project head was a real nice guy, like gave me a sit down. We talked for a few hours and I was using it to like do my boring research. But then when it came time and I was looking at consulting jobs a year and a half, two years later, um, I got back in touch with him and like he was able to make a connection with a partner in D.C. And like I was genuinely very interested in what this project was doing. So I mentioned it in my interview. So it does like think broadly, like seek out connections of, on things that interest you. Um, and then like maintain those relationships as, as you can, um, because it is fascinating how like years down the road, you like, you look back and you're like, huh, it, like it didn't, I did not have a plan at the time, but it did work out and it did all connect. I second that. Okay. Aaron, any other thoughts that you had that you didn't get a chance to air and the questions that yeah. One last thing, and this is because Jessica mentioned doing something boring, learn Excel, make sure you know mm -hmm. how Excel works. Um, you know, just take a Coursera class if you have to just just know it. Mm -hmm. YouTube tutorials, anything you can do. Yeah. Agree. Yeah, and I know you'll say all of you are probably saying like I know how to use Excel. Excel has so many more properties that you don't realize Excel has. Like I know you can do like a sum. I know you how to like how to do a spreadsheet, and that's what I thought too um, before I went to work for Deloitte. And a lot of what those consulting companies sell is people who just have a real expertise of these skills that everybody thinks they know, but there's just like all these additional layers that when you really master Excel, you're like, whoa, Excel is cool and fun. Um, I once bit, like spent an entire afternoon at, in Tel Aviv building, building a bidding spreadsheet because I was very stressed about something else. And I decided I could do this very effectively with a giant Excel spreadsheet and I could. Um, so yes, I know you all think like Microsoft Word, like that's boring. I learned how to do that in third grade. Mm -hmm. um, but I would bet 80% of you don't realize like the different applications of it. Yeah, Word is like when you do a deep dive into Word, which I've had to do in the last couple of years. I, I didn't know it would do that. I didn't know it would do that. So it's, yeah, but definitely the Excel piece. I feel like I have to retrain myself on that all the time. Okay. Uh, what's Allison saying? Oh, okay. Oh, now the chat's getting busy. Hang on, guys. If you can spare us just a moment. Um, oh, Pitt has great Excel tutorials. There's some Pitt students on here. You can go to mypit.edu, but your other schools probably offer it too. So we're not leaving, leaving you out. Question, in what ways did your graduate degree prepare you for your career? They're asking specifically about your graduate degrees. Um, can you each do that in a word, a, few, a sentence or two? Um, so the Foreign Service doesn't hire for a specific knowledge base. 
So they didn't hire me because I knew Bosnia. They didn't hire me because I had a EU um, studies certificate. So I would say for my job, it's more in terms of skill set um, mm-hmm. as opposed to like specific pieces of knowledge. Um, so for us, writing is really important. The ability, it's different for sure, like academic writing versus um, foreign service writing. Um, but generally the idea of like clear, concise writing that knows who your audience is and targets your message. Um, that's something I got, I got out of not just grad school, but like education writ large. Um, the idea of being broadly informed. Um, so the idea of like taking responsibility to make sure that like, you know, kind of what the top line issues are. And for me, that's like, it'll change, right? Like right now I'm going into a human rights position, but if I go into a job covering environmental and scientific issues, like the idea to just like be well read, um, that, you know, you're always, I'm expected to be always learning kind of like you are when you're a student. Um, and then the other thing I jotted down on this, cause I think it's, it's a, it's a useful exercise, even if you don't go into a job like mine, um, is the practice of arguing a position that you disagree with. Um, so no foreign service officer is going to agree with every single position, foreign policy position of the U.S. government. Um, and that's not just speaking about um, the Trump administration, which got a lot of publicity for the division between the State Department and um, the White House. Um, but, you know, even the Iraq war. Um, there are plenty of foreign service officers who went and served in Baghdad uh, and fundamentally disagreed with the premise that we should be there. Um, we moved the embassy to uh, Jerusalem when I was serving in Israel. Um, a lot of foreign service officers would have recommended strongly against that and did so. Uh, but at the end of the day, once the policy decision is made, um, part of our job is to um, publicly support it and advocate for it and try and get our allies on board. Um, so the idea of taking a controversial issue and being able to write a paper or to defend that publicly, um, even when in your heart of hearts you don't believe what you're saying, um, it's it's tough. It feels a little disingenuous at times. I get that. Um, but for my job, it's it, it's very important to be able to kind of separate yourself sometimes and think about like, OK, well, if I were to um, be on the other policy camp, this is ultimately the policy. What is the best argument I can make to defend it? And briefly, the other side of that is being, uh, in, in my research degree, as being able to dig really deep into a narrow question. Um, I think that's undervalued in many government offices. Um, and in fact, it got me into a couple headbutting matches at times at USAID. Um, but it's, a, it's, it's useful to uh, be a, directed in your skepticism and I think be able to dive deep in order to um, ask whether things are right or wrong or for what reason. Um, and the other thing uh, the training prepared prepared me for was, you know, languages. I think just learning another language and traveling around as an undergrad or in a graduate capacity um, and engaging with people in their native language is, you know, it has, it has, preparatory value beyond just, um, you know, getting by in another country. So it's. Yeah. And language is also um, back to Eric's question about hiring. Um, Certainly in the foreign service, I don't know if like USAID foreign service as well, but we do give additional hiring points um, without getting into like all the details of foreign service hiring for people who have, um, specific language skills at a at the necessary level now if you can only like make you know order coffee that's that's not sufficient it needs it does need to be like pretty proficient um but it is something that can help make an application more competitive both in terms of like yes it's always on your resume but um at least for the foreign service we do hire with language um as a priority and that or or we'll teach it to you if you don't have it because i am just learning all the languages all of them (laughs) Good to know. Um, last thing I'll note quickly is that, at, you know, political science is a highly quantitative field now, uh, at least mainstream political science as is uh, instructed and trained at University of Pittsburgh. Uh, and so data visualization has helped me greatly in my career and being able to express uh, complex data in beautiful images is a number one top in demand thing these days. So. 
learn Excel and then learn how to make beautiful things in R if you can. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Well, thanks for staying a few minutes late to our speakers. Very grateful for your generosity. And a round of virtual applause uh, to you both. Mm -hmm. Thank you very, very much um, for all of your help. Thank you and all that wonderful feedback. I was taking notes myself. Really appreciate it.